Hey, this video is a reflection on David Hurley's book, Visual Tools for Transforming Information into Knowledge. In this book, David's focus is on the use of visual tools in the classroom to facilitate learning and the creation of knowledge. However, his recommendations are equally applicable to using visual approaches at work or in your personal knowledge management. David provides a practical framework for identifying the different thinking tasks, such as creative thinking, analytical thinking, and reflective thinking, and offers tools and approaches best fit for each. My goal is that by the end of this video, you will develop the understanding that will allow you to be more deliberate when choosing the visual tool for the task at hand. Let me start with a short personal story about having the right tools. A few years ago, while traveling, I ran into a situation where I had to fix the brake on my unicycle. I was traveling light and only had a pocket multi-tool with me. While my tool offered a healthy set of options to deal with different type of screws, the brake pads were secured with six slope star screws, a type I did not have on the multi-tool. I tried using my Phillips head screwdriver to unscrew the brake pad, but had no luck. In the end, I was forced to find a shop and buy a Torx screwdriver to complement my existing multi-tool. It turns out that even something as simple as a screw requires a whole toolbox of tools. Most brain researchers believe that we receive around 70% of information from our environment through our eyes. Our brains are dominantly visual. Neuroscientists also tell us that the brain organizes information in continuously evolving multidimensional networks and maps. Our brain is transforming information into knowledge by mapping it and by building a network of connections. This is why visual thinking tools that facilitate mapping work so well. They build on capabilities our brain already does so well. David argues that we don't even need to look to neuroscience to recognize that mapping is fundamental to our understanding. Creating a map of the empire has always been a key step in solidifying power and establishing control. This is why, for example, Lewis and Clark's expedition, and especially the maps they authored, are so important. Written and verbal presentations deliver information linearly. As we internalize this information, we need to transform this linear stream into a mental map of the subject. This requires lots of effort. David argues that linear note-taking is less effective than visual mapping because of the mismatch between the interconnected thoughts and the linear nature of text. Consider the following little experiment. I will flash up first a description of a scene and then a picture representing the same. I will show both for five seconds. At the end of the exercise, I will ask you to reflect which one was easier to take in. Ready? If you are like me, the text was likely a blur. Maybe you didn't even have enough time to focus and start reading. The painting, on the other hand, probably conveyed the core of the story. An army defeating the enemy. To be fair, the text includes lots of other details the painting does not. For delivering a more complete understanding, a mix of text and images work the best. The point I'm trying to make is not that prose is bad and images are good, but that our brain is geared to process images. By using visual tools, you can both support this capability as well as build on it for faster, deeper learning and more creative knowledge generation. Let's look into our toolbox 
and look at tools to support creative thinking. These tools focus on enabling flexibility. They facilitate creating, imagining, and innovating. The object is to help you think independently, remaining open to continuous learning. Here, the goal is to think outside the box. All of the processes I will present use similar techniques, usually generating from a central point on a page to the outward perimeters to fully capture a concept. Most of these techniques inspire a unique blend of intellectual curiosity and artistic expression that contributes to the construction of knowledge. One of the most prevalent misconceptions about brainstorming webs is that they involve simple, one-step processes of visually linking free associations without a special technique. Another misconception is that brainstorming is used only at the beginning of a process, then left to the side after the initial brainstorm. This later is a key reason why visual brainstorming with Xcolid Raw in Obsidian is so effective. It is extremely simple to integrate the results of your brainstorming into later phases of your creative process. Brainstorming webs are usually guided by a focus question or a defined objective, such as, what is my topic? Or what do I need to produce? Webbing facilitates the unrestrained generation of ideas with individualistic graphics and promotes organizational and analytical structuring of information. Brainstorming webs are not just starting points, but they can evolve in sophistication as we progress with developing the subject. One mistake people tend to make is to stop the webbing process too soon and immediately move on to revision and structuring of a product. Because clustering techniques are simple, they offer a practical process of being in touch with your holistic flow of ideas. After creating initial clusters, you should revise your drawing into more focused webs, thus leading to greater clarity of thinking and writing. Mind mapping is based on early research showing left and right brain dominance for linear and holistic operations respectively. Tony Buzan created the techniques of mind mapping to support creativity and memory and to deepen these links of creative functions to logical operations. Buzan's model has specific graphic techniques for mind mapping that support memory, expansion and depth of concepts and for readability so that collaborative problem solvers may more easily share their maps. Although Buzan suggests that learners share common techniques, he also emphasizes the development of personal style in mapping. The next set of tools in our toolbox are for analytical thinking. These tools help you manage impulsivity, support persistence and facilitate accuracy. The goal here is to gather and process data from all senses and to communicate your thoughts with precision and clarity. These tools are for thinking inside the box. Graphic organizers are designed for the purpose of analytical structuring and displaying information. Most of these visual tools are created for content specific tasks and for defined process skills. One content specific graphic organizer most of us have probably come across in school are story organizers for studying literature. These are content specific in that they are designed specifically for the content and are not transferable to other content areas unlike process graphic organizers, which we will look at later. The goal setting template is another example of a content specific organizer to facilitate breaking down a stretch goal into sprints and individual tasks. Moving on to process specific graphic organizers, Venn diagrams were developed 
in 1898 by John Venn as a logic tool for showing category structure and to show overlapping categories. Circles represent categories. Items placed at the intersection of circles represent cases that fit both or all of the overlapping categories. Items that are in non-overlapping areas only fit one specific category. Beyond categorization, Venn diagrams are also often used for comparing objects or concepts. The Fishbone or Ishikawa diagram is another example of a process-specific graphic organizer. These diagrams facilitate cause and effect analysis. Follow these eight steps to complete a cause and effect analysis as a team. Identify the effect, place this to the head of the fish. Identify the category names. There are many domain-specific models available, but you can also develop your own categories. Use a round robin to suggest possible causes. Discuss the suggested causes, privately rank the causes, Use a round robin to make an unduplicated list of the causes. Vote for rank order. Prepare an explanation of the choices. The final set of tools that we will look at today are for reflective thinking. These tools will help you listen with empathy and understanding. They are tools to facilitate thinking about thinking, i.e. metacognition. Their purpose is to apply past knowledge to new situations and to take calculated risks. Making sense of conceptual maps requires context building. They are significantly different from brainstorming webs and graphic organizers. In her book, Concept-Based Curriculum and Instruction, Lynn Erickson makes the case that knowledge is structured hierarchically with facts at the bottom leading up through topics, concepts, principles, and finally theoretical claims. This view of knowledge reflects a traditional view of how information is transformed into knowledge by way of ever more inclusive categories. It is important to also notice that this visual map is central to the power of conceptual mapping. Conceptual maps are tools based on visually representing conceptual growth and inductive and deductive development of concepts. These tools provide a more concrete way to work with complexity, matching the capacities of our brains to see both the big picture and the details in linear and holistic form. The first tool that we will look at is the inductive tower. This was developed by John Clark, professor of education at the University of Vermont. The tower is based on inductive hierarchical reasoning. At work and at school, we are often tasked to develop details about a topic starting with a main idea at the top of the map. The inductive tower turns this process on its head by providing a tool for building categories or groups of ideas from an array of information at the bottom of the map. You then build the tower upward to the top. With each grouping at different levels of the map, you are constructing more inclusive and abstract concepts. At the top of the map, is a generalization or category heading that represents the multiple levels of facts and inductively created concepts. Dialogue and argument mapping using issue-based information systems or IBIS in short, is an example of concept mapping. This method is presented in detail in Visualizing Argumentation published in 2003. IBIS is an argumentative approach to discussing and solving wicked problems. As a side note, wicked problems, as opposed to tame problems, are difficult to define, involve many stakeholders, lack an objective measure of success, and every attempt to solve them changes the problem. The three key IBIS entries are issues, positions, and arguments, which are linked by relationships such as supports, objects to, 
replaces temporal successor of, more general than, and their converses. Visualized as a graph, an IBIS grows into a network as more issues are posted and debated. As a simple example, the figure shows a small IBIS map for a meeting of a school board faced with a budget shortfall. Generally, these maps are constructed from left to right, thus the root cause in this map is what should we do about the budget? There are three possible answers and three additional questions about the first two ideas. Another example of visualizing argumentation that I will not dive into today is the ArcDown standard. I only mention ArcDown because there is an ArcDown Obsidian plugin available in the plugin store. The next set of conceptual mapping tools targets systems thinking and feedback flow. David Hurley's book contains multiple examples, but for sake of timing, I will only introduce one. Systems feedback loops have been used in many fields to show cycles. Feedback loops may be used to show the dynamic interrelationships among the variables in a system. While systems thinking does not absolutely require mapping using feedback loops, it is hard to imagine representing a system and all its complex interdependencies other than through visual means. The final tool we will look at today is called Mindscaping. The foundation for Mindscaping is in the metaphorical drawing of ideas and is most useful when attempting to see the big picture of an idea, vision or outcome. As much as an artist has an image in mind for an idea, you need to identify a concrete image in everyday life, such as a path, a building, or a plate of food, to represent both the conceptual basis and the detailed interrelationships for an idea. Like any rich metaphor, it is important that the image is a clear metaphoric reflection of the idea rather than merely a placeholder for information. Begin with an idea and identify a concrete image of the idea that seems to represent the topic. As you begin to sketch the image, think about how each part of the object may represent different concepts or aspects of the idea. After making an outline of the major parts of the object and linking them to the concept, begin adding details to the picture. Add colors and words and return to the picture to revise. This is as much as I can squeeze into today's video. David Hurley's book is not a particularly easy read, but it contains a wealth of information on visual thinking and knowledge creation. In case there is interest, I may in the future create a separate video about his thinking maps concept, which is a toolbox of eight different thinking tools targeting eight specific thinking skills. I hope you found today's video helpful and that this discussion has helped you to be more deliberate in choosing the thinking tool for the task, be it creative thinking, analytical thinking or reflective thinking.